The attack on meat continues. The mission to turn us all into soy boys. I feel like you're you're already on your way there. No. Oh, cheers. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> People in glass houses, Harry. Um, so yeah, they're, they're trying to turn us all into soy boys, and this is gaining traction in the media, um, and it seems like the institutional capture of the media um, seems to be reaching its zenith. And worst of all, and, and this is particularly egregious, they're coming for our fish and chips in Britain. I mean... This what, is what one could of the be worse greatest than that? institutions <laughs> of our culture. Yes, we lost the empire. Our queen is basically a pointless figurehead at this point, and <laughs> all of our harsh. and all of our politicians are completely useless and neutered. But at least we've still got the fish and chips, guys. Nothing I mean, like going to a seaside town, get some fish and chips with the fam. The only thing that could be worse than this is dumping tea in Boston Harbour, isn't it? Really. I mean, even that then, I don't know if we still lost... Still brings a tear to my eye. I don't know if we lost anything particularly worthwhile in that interaction. So, you know, the fish and chips brings value. <laughs> what, you're not a fan of tea? Well, oh, yeah, the, tea, the loss of the... I thought you meant the loss of the American colonies. No, I mean the tea. Oh, yeah, well, the tea was obviously a heartbreak. <laughs> so, yes, it's, it's worth pointing out that um, there is a case for environmentalism, but a conservative case, which you have pointed out. Yes. Here in this premium video on the website, which is worth checking out. So I, I think any good conservative is somebody who does care about the environment, both in terms of just you know caring about the uh, nature for the sake of it, but also recognizing that there are many good qualities that nature can bring to your life, such as you and I know the joys of just going for a quiet walk in the forest mm -hmm. by yourself. It can be very therapeutic, so I think this is very important. And plus, just generally, if we want to preserve the institutions and culture that we like, we don't want to be paving over the country. But as far as I can see it, the only real way to do uh, to preserve it properly is to ha institute private property in basically every section of life, mm -hmm. because then you're giving people an incentive to actually preserve something. Whereas the government, yeah, they have the green belts across England, but they are cutting more and more into those every single day with the need to build more houses instead of you know, preventing mass immigration. So, with that clarification out of the way, let's have a look at the fish and chip story. So, fish and chips could soon be taken off the menu as, I think that's the World Wildlife Fund, report calls for government action. So, the report titled Risky Seafood Business investigated the total number of fish consumed by Brits. The WWF claim, not, it's not the World Wrestling Federation by the way. Ah, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Vince McMahon spreading his tendrils over here. <laughs> the WWF claims that a total of 887,000 tonnes of seafood was eaten by people in 2019, the equivalent to 5.2 billion portions of fish and chips. This is a good thing. This brings a tear to my eye. It's actually making me hungry just talking about <laughs> it. <laughs> Among the most popular fish included haddock and cod, which accounted for 29% of the total. While 81% of the seafood was fished or farmed outside UK waters, um, the WWF also investigated supply chains of 33%, um, th no, that's not right, 33 of the most popular seafood items to determine the risk each poses in terms of production and consumption. Mussels, sardines, and herrings were found to be relatively low risk, but swordfish, tuna, and squid were deemed to be high risk. Have you ever had swordfish before? It's very nice. No, I haven't actually. Once had it for breakfast in the Mediterranean. I, mean, I suppose swordfish could be high risk, but it depends on you know how you eat it. <laughs> if you eat it point first, it might be a bit dangerous. Yeah. That's a terrible dad joke. I am very sorry. Um, the report went on to say that more than 250 endangered, threatened and protected species have been impacted by fisheries supplying the UK markets. As a result, the WWF is urging for more to be done to address the problem, calling uh, on the government to take action to ensure that all seafood Produced and consumed in the UK comes from sustainably or from sustainable sources by 2030. Just the thought of fish and chips is throwing me off reading, apparently. It really is. It's, it's your mouth watering is so distracting. Yes. See, it's how you test people um, if they're truly British. You put a plate full of uh, fish and chips in front of them and test how much they're salivating. And if you're, <laughs> if you're truly British, you'll be drooling by a Drooling in and... no time, yeah. <laughs> no, see, I, I, I see this and I go, well, yeah, if you want to protect the fish... Uh, especially if we're going to be eating them, you mm -hmm. probably don't want to fish them into we extinction. don't want to overfish them, yes. Uh, but I don't see government as being any sort of solution to these problems. When has uh, basically non-ownership slash communal ownership of anything, which is basically what the government does, uh, actually incentivized anyone to keep it sustainable? I say 
let me buy all of the fish in the world and I will keep them safe for you. I'll have regular allocations of how much you can fish and what you have to do to offset the damage done by the fishing and maybe then if you give people a primary incentive mm -hmm. to be able to actually protect them beyond, you know, uh, charity groups petitioning the government, then maybe you mm -hmm. will actually get some sustainable fishing done. The main thing I protest is obviously the government intervention, but also the fact that it's a negative interpretation of the situation in that there are lots of ways you can encourage fish populations to grow more. Um, you can also farm certain species. I know some don't fare well with um, I mean, ev evidently, just supplying UK markets with enough fish to meet demand is a very lucrative business, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there are going to be some form of solutions. I mean, you could even go kind of the Bill Gates route of dumping loads of chemicals in the sea that are good for fish. Um, if it works, I mean, that doesn't just, hurt anything else. You know, I don't, I don't know enough about it, and it sounds bad. So, <laughs> we'll just dump the chemicals in the water. Wait, no. If they make the fish gay, it'd be nutrients, not, if they not make chemicals. The, if they make the fish gay. They won't reproduce. We lose all the fish anyway. Be a, a massive trap to catch out Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> Him and so, his fish sticks. <laughs> the article continues. Uh, WWF spokeswoman Kate Norgove said, the ocean is the blue heart of our planet, which is objectively not true. I mean, most of the life is on the surface, isn't it? Like the big animals, that sort of thing. There are lots of ocean deserts where just nothing lives. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, fair play. I, I always hear the old chestnut of the like, oh, we don't know what's really at the depths of the oceans. Anything could be down there. But I've never looked into it beyond just hearing people say that. Maybe even a whole city. Ooh. Uh, protecting this precarious resource should be the top pri priority of every single fishery around the world. Yet for too long, unsustainable practices have gone unchecked, draining the ocean of life. Miss Norgrove added, moves to strengthen certification for sustainable seafood across the supply chain are a vital first step, but they are not the end point. Along with efforts from... Retailers to improve transparency across global seafood supply chains, establishing core environmental standards for all food sold in the UK, including seafood, which has a transformative impact. We are urging the UK government to play its part and take that step. So, translating from activist speak, that means either increased regulations, which mm -hmm. will choke the supply of fish and chips, well, well, fish, which will you know, ruin a lot of people's small businesses. Because it'll ruin my life. It'll ruin our lives, first of all, <laughs> but then it'll also ruin the businesses of plenty of fish and chip shops, which is one of the only really reliable businesses that you can <laughs> open in the UK. Either that or just ban it outright, which is going to have the same effect, just worse. So, moving on to lots of other media reporting on stuff. The BBC have caught on to this and they've asked, can eating fish ever be sustainable? To which all you need to say is yes, so that must be a very short article. Um, moving on to <laughs> the next BBC article, the climate benefits of uh, veganism and vegetarianism. Don't so it's care. nice that our state mandated uh, media outlet is just trying to push us all to be vegans and vegetarians. This mm, don't is, you love paying for this? Well, I don't. Quality journalism. I don't pay my licence fee. Um, true. There's, there's no need to... I mean, I don't watch any TV. I think TV's terrible for you. So moving on to this next Guardian article. Um, they're also, of course, chipping in, the, the main left-wing outlet. How can the UK reduce meat consumption and cut emissions? It says, the most damaging farm products, organic pasture-fed beef and lamb. So, so it's all the, all all the, the posh good, stuff. Not even the posh stuff, like organic pasture-fed beef and lamb are the stuff that most like nutritionists will tell you they're the best meats for the you. The healthiest, yeah. The healthiest ones that will help you get... And healthiest get... for the animals themselves as well. Yeah, so the most humane. You. So Guardian comes out in favour of battery farming. Interesting, <laughs> interesting direction to take. So they, they go on to say, England must reduce meat intake to avoid climate breakdown, says food czar. What? Why, why call it a food czar? Uh, yeah. That's so weird. Czar Nicholas II of food. <laughs> well, he's known for causing loads of people to starve, so it's not exactly the best I mean, Yeah, if we're getting advice on the Russia, from the Russians on how, to, <laughs> how not Obviously. to starve our population. <laughs> Obviously, it's just the name for an authority. We're not being... People will be like, well, it actually means this in the comments. Well, we know, all right? <laughs> So it carries on to say, the future of farming is in the spotlight as we try to shift our relationship with the natural world. Globally, 83% of farmland is taken up by livestock. Many scientists and campaigners are arguing for an overhaul of meat and dairy consumption to free up more land for nature and reduce emissions. Also, 
just the vague language of many scientists and campaigners. Oh yeah, that this... Just like, many. How many is many? What percentage? As like... you expect with an article like this, the language is incredibly manipulative. I always hate the use of the first per uh, person plural, we, when discussing stuff like this, because it's mm -hmm. like, I never agreed to this. Mm -hmm. You never agreed to this. This is the government deciding this on my behalf without my mm -hmm. consent, as always. But that's democracy for you. But the extent of the institutional capture of this anti-meat tirade has captivated lots of medical institutions as well. Here's Medical News Today saying, the green Mediterranean diet could be a win-win for health and the planet. And it says, people who eat a traditional Mediterranean diet have lower rates of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. But new research suggests that a green Mediterranean diet, which avoids all meat and provides extra greens, may be even better for human health. If the diet catches on, the benefits for planetary health could be equally impressive. And by the way, the Mediterranean diet, if you don't live in Europe, it's things like olives, um, your breads, that sort of thing. It's I imagine it also includes Italy. a lot of fish. Yeah, normally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it's very nice, very healthy. I, I love Mediterranean food. I think it's... I'm, I'm going to be a heretic and say that it's better than fish and chips. I know. I'm a meat and potatoes kind of lad, me, oh, personally. You're a northern lad, aren't you? I'm, I'm from the... the yeah, the, the fanciest we got up there is Sunday roast. <laughs> I'm a dirty southerner that grew up on the coast, so seafood abounds. I know. But yeah, it carries on to say... Climate scientists believe that one of the most impactful things that people can do for the environment is to reduce their consumption of meat and dairy products. And this is going to go on and on and on, as you're going to see. Research, um, research trusted sources notes. I mean, if they're calling themselves trusted sources, that must be true. It's like the Inflation Reduction Act, you know? It's just, <laughs> it says it on the name, why not trust it? That global production of animal-based foods, including livestock feed, accounts for 57% of total greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, whereas production of plant-based foods accounts for only 29%. Another study estimates, I mean, there is the fact that plants breathe in carbon. I mean, that's probably why. That plants are carbon negative when they're actually existing before you harvest them. Obviously, the production of them and cultivation for human consumption uses carbon, but still. It's, it's a weird characterization. Another study estimates that if everyone became vegan, this would reduce the amount of land worldwide that farmers need to grow food by 3.1 billion hectares, or 76%, which is an absurd proposition. I don't trust this. I don't trust mm -hmm. any of these studies. These studies will probably be, well, if we just take the food that we're feeding the animals and just eat that instead, then, you know, everything will be fine. We won't need to farm all of these animals. And you go, well... I don't want to eat farm food. Well, like some industries are better than others. Like if you eat venison in Britain, you're doing the country a favour because deer is a pest because we got rid of all the natural predators because we killed them and ate them and skinned them for ourselves. Because we one... could. Yes. And we don't every... need any more reason. Now we have no bears. We can walk around at, at night in the woods and it's safe. That's yeah, and it's lovely. And people are thinking, let's reintroduce wolves into our lovely, peaceful forests. On the topic of that, oh, no. um, in addition to cutting emissions from food production, say the authors, rewilding the freed up land would remove 8.1 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year for the next 100 years. Do, so, yes. not, do not trust the experts. Do this not is, listen to the experts. Don't forget, this is medical news today. And they're, yes, we're going to rewild the environment. This is somehow our purview, isn't it? So... Here's another one from Scientific American, who are insufferable. Eating less red meat is something individuals can do to help the climate crisis. How about no? Moving on. <laughs> um, this is from a company known as Fast Company. I've not really heard of them before, but they're saying it's time for a meat tax. Here's how to make it work. See, this is where it always comes in. It's always <laughs> it either it's either we get daddy government to ban it or we get mm -hmm. daddy government to tax it. That's mm -hmm. the only solution these absolute retards have. <laughs> so the article says, rearing livestock and growing crops to feed them has destroyed more tropical forests and killed more wildlife than any other industry. Do you think that... <sighs> yes, do you think that's that, how powerful the industry is. But logging... Do you think that maybe the logging industry has destroyed more tropical forest? No, I think that's just how much we love meat. It's the cows that are this doing This is it. our domination of the <laughs> earth. That's what the, all this is showing is our supremacy. <laughs> Animal agriculture has also produced vast quantities of greenhouse gas emissions, blah, 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 blah. So it carries on to say, to slash emissions, slow the loss of biodiversity and secure food for a growing world population, which I don't necessarily approve of, um, there must be a change in the way meat and dairy are made and consumed. A rapidly evolving market for novel alternatives such as plant-based burgers, boo, 
has made the switch from meat easier. Yet in countries such as Britain, meat consumption has not fallen fast enough in recent years to sufficiently rein in agricultural emissions. That's because we don't want to eat yeah. your stupid plant-based nonsense. The rapidly evolving market. What's, what's that market looking like? Well, I know what the people who eat it look like, skin and bones. And that's enough to put me if off it. If you want to make yourself feel ill, Google fruititarian um, oh, and look God. at some images of them. Um, they look like they've been let out of Auschwitz. They they don't look healthy at all. No, but also this is just another example of how this is not at all a grassroots, le <laughs> ironic, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, grassroots movement of people just deciding all at once, oh, yes, we need to do these measures to save mm -hmm. the world because these plant-based uh, plant based foods generally don't sell very well. Yes. I mean, whenever there are shortages, you just see all of the plant-based stuff left. Like, I would we might be hungry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> And it carries on to say, in our view, the most likely result will be simply, um, simple even, I don't know how I misread that, direct taxes on meat and animal products. Our latest research, published in the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy, considers how an environmental tax on meat could work. Our calculations suggest that the average retail price for meat in high-income countries would need to increase by, by 35 to 56 percent for beef, 25% for poultry, and 19% for lamb and pork to reflect the environmental cost of their production. In the UK, where the average price for a 200 gram beef steak, or about a quarter pound, is around 2.8 pounds, or about $3.4, um, consumers would pay between 3.8 pounds and 4.3 pounds, or about $4.60 or $5.20 at the checkout instead. So that's a significant markup yeah, meat. so we're in the middle of this um, infl massively inflationary period right now mm -hmm. over in the West, and people are struggling to f uh, clothe and feed themselves, especially with energy bills and such, and we are starting to come up to autumn, which will lead to winter, and these people are suggesting, let's punish people who are already struggling more. Mm -hmm. The food that you want that will keep you alive is now almost twice the price in some cases. It's... <laughs> It's unbelievably out of touch, isn't it? it? It's it's absolutely ridiculous and disgusting. But they're also going for new means here. So here's an article from the Scientific American again. Eating too much protein makes pee a problem pollutant in the US. In the US, people eat more protein than they need to. Although it might not be bad for human health, this excess does pose a problem for the country's waterways. The nation's Wastewater is laden with leftovers from protein digestion, nitrogen compounds that feed toxic algae blooms, pollute the air and drinking water. This source of nitrogen pollution even rivals that from fertilizers um, washed off of fields and growing food crops, new research suggests. Well, we have such a thing known as sewage treatment plants, and if this nitrogen, this excess nitrogen is a problem, I suggest you just treat it at the sewage treatment plant. I mean, it's it's that easy. Also, if this is such a problem, I've not seen any of the uh, effects of it personally, mm -hmm. you would think that this would be causing some major issues if it was as much of a problem as they're suggesting. Mm -hmm. So, the most egregious of all of these scientific institutions is the, the journal Nature, which is the kind of premier scientific journal. Many uh, scientists would donate a kidney to get a, an article published here. Uh, they have an article saying, eating one-fifth less beef could half deforestation. I mean, that... All of these outlets are directly pushing this. It, the agenda is very clear. Mm -hmm. They're not hiding it in the slightest. And uh, speaking of agendas, let's have a look at the BBC. Um, it says, lab-grown meat and insects good for planet and health. No. <laughs> Apparently, dining on the likes of lab-grown meat or ground-up insects could lead to big savings in carbon emissions and water, as well as freeing up land for nature. I don't care about any of those things that much to eat insects. Yeah, that, that's, that's the funny thing as well. None of these are telling me why it will benefit me mm -hmm. to eat these. It'll, it'll benefit all these abstract things like the environment, like nature, deforestation of forests that you will never visit in your entire life halfway across the world. I don't care. If you want to sell this stuff to me, you're going to have to sell it to me. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to work because I don't want to eat lab-grown meat and I don't want to eat bugs. They're arguing here that scientists say pressures on the planet could fall by more than 80% with such foods compared with a typical European diet. So it's just another attack on Europeans, coincidentally. It's funny, that, isn't it? And then... Yeah, we need to start yeah. eating bugs like the Chinese. That's what we need to do. <laughs> yes, because we need to model all our behaviour on the Chinese because they've just got everything figured out, haven't they? John, John approves. In the <laughs> <laughs> Raising his fist in solidarity. <laughs> um, so here we have Forbes. Um, 
eating insects could cut the um, cut your environmental impact by more than 80%, Finnish study says, so they're reporting pretty much on the same thing that the BBC were. And of course, the elephant in the room here is this next article. Um, this is from the World Economic Forum. Five reasons why eating insects could reduce climate change. And I'm going to read out the five reasons. Edible insects can produce equivalent amounts of quality protein when compared to animals. That's just a lie. Quality protein. That's an Does actual it taste lie. The same? No, no, and it's not, it's not even that, because they're going to make the argument that the uh, amino acids contained within mm -hmm. the protein are going to make up all your nutritional uh, uh, so-and-so. That's just a lie. <laughs> I mean, you get different quality proteins on, from chicken depending on mm -hmm. how they've been raised. So I doubt that insects are going to give me the quality protein I need <laughs> to sure survive. It's nonsense, yeah. Insects require less care and upkeep than livestock. We're actually running out of protein, which is nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? We've just run out of protein. <laughs> Guys, meat just vanished. I mean... The World Economic Forum are not considering that people have protein in them as well. I mean, we, we Where's all, it all gone? We, we are literally able to manufacture powder that has protein in it, so I <laughs> doubt we're running out of that anytime soon. It's such a ridiculous statement. Obviously, when I was saying people are made of protein, I'm not suggesting start eating people. But if it came to it. I mean, yeah, move to Papua New Guinea, get along with the locals, cannibalise your neighbours. It's all good. Um, so, <laughs> they go on to say, insects are part of a virtuous eco-cycle, and you can start small and work your way up. You can start with an ant and maybe end with, I don't know, a giant African so, land snail. Are they, are they making an argument from virtue here? <laughs> God! Listen to virtue from the World Economic Forum, yes. You heard it here first. But it's worse than that. There are also outlets like Mashed um, who are trying Not to get you to... potatoes? <laughs> well, they are. They want you to eat potato peels. But they're saying 14 food scraps you didn't know were edible. And it's just like, yes, we're going to make you eat food scraps. So they say potato peels, herb stalks, carrot tops, parmesan rinds, which sounds disgusting, juice pulp, cauliflower leaves, orange peels, banana peels. Can you imagine eating either of those? Um, Wait, you, they're, sprout they're tops, literally saying you can eat hearts, banana peel. What? <laughs> broccoli stalks, watermelon rinds, beet greens, and almond milk pulp. This is well, disgusting. Finally, I've got a use for all that almond milk pulp. So if I'm just around. walking down the street and feeling a bit peckish, oh, banana peels stray on the pavement mm, yummy yummy <laughs> yeah, no Ma mario kart's forever ruined <laughs> so it, it gets even worse than that so wind turbine <laughs> blades could be recycled into gummy bears scientists say i don't know what the scientists have been uh, sampling but it sounds like some pretty hard drugs. they've been sniffing some f gummy fumes maybe <laughs> the next generation of wind turbine blades could be recycled into gummy bears at the end of their service scientists have said Researchers at Michigan State University have made a composite resin for the blades by combining glass fibres with plant-derived polymer and a synthetic one. I don't like the idea of having gummy bears made of glass fibres. That sounds slightly, you know, off the beaten path. <laughs> Just eat some glass, why not? <laughs> Window lickers rejoice. <laughs> Once the blades have reached the end of their lifespan, the materials can be broken down and recycled to make new uh, products, including turbine blades and chewy sweets. The wind power is one of the dominant forms of renewable energy. I don't know whether that's true. However, turbine... I mean, surely um, that would be nuclear. Um, however, turbine blades made of fiberglass can be as uh, long as half a football field and cause problems with disposal, with many discarded in landfills when they reach the end of their uh, use cycle. I mean, Do you want to eat a wind turbine gummy bear? I don't think so. They're mostly useless <laughs> anyway. So, no, can you imagine like going to the <laughs> going to the wind turbine mm -hmm. farm and this farmer just smacks his hand on it? This bad boy can hold so many gummy bears. Mm -hmm. So, I want to take us on to a bit of a tangent because I thought it was funny. But <laughs> here's an article from Psychology Today: Why autism might not make you a better environmentalist. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder what relevance this has, eh? <laughs> the climate activist Greta Thunberg has credited her autism with giving her the ability to stay focused on the climate emergency. She once tweeted, I have Asperger's, and that means I'm sometimes a bit different from the norm. And given the right circumstances, being different is a superpower. Oh no, she's been watching too much Hollywood. <laughs> Christ, that Predator movie where it's like, actually, do you know that autism might just be the next stage of evolution? Big brain Hollywood screenwriters. So you people watching at home, congratulations. <laughs> so, All of us in the office with the higher <laughs> beings. <laughs> so um, there is some good stuff going on. People like Lord Frost are saying that um, 
denies that there's a climate emergency and says we should bring back fracking and nuclear energy. I mean, obviously, yes. We've also got the North Sea full of oil. I mean, come on. So Please. all of this climate emergency nonsense. You could save the uh, cost of living mm -hmm. crisis at the same time if you did all of this. Mm -hmm. However, we have people like Prince Charles, um, who, who is, is our a future traitor. king. Prince Charles calls on public and private sector to unlock trillions for sustainability eco-drive. He is to be the head of our country one day. Great. I'm, also, World Economic Forum bought and sold. I'm glad that if he, when Queen Elizabeth goes, that we've probably got like 20 years of Charles tops. That's true, thankfully, yeah. he's already still very old. <laughs> but if you're looking for religious guidance as well, I'm afraid if you're Catholic, that's not great either. Pope Francis tells young people in Europe to eat less meat for the environment. So yes, we got the woke Pope. So, however, the UK government at the minute has at least outwardly claimed that we won't be forced to eat less meat to uh, halt global warming because um, humans are ultimately omnivores, which is surprisingly reasonable from our own government. Oh, it's a blatant lie, though, let's be honest. I don't trust anything that the well, government says. Well, I don't says. trust the government, but it's nice that they're saying it. <laughs> <laughs> they're giving me a nice pat on the back and telling me and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, I, it obviously makes sense not to believe them, but it contributes to the validity of our argument when the government itself agrees with us. Um, that's true, but in the year 2000, if you'd said, by 2030, you're planning on taking everyone's cars away, they'd have said no. That's true. I, I'm not saying that they should be trusted, I'm just saying that at least they've weighed in on our side. I mean, it's a small I, mercy, but I it's suppose something. so. But yes, these sorts of things enable eco-lunatics like Just Up Oil. Um, so here's an article talking about the fact that they have damaged fuel pumps on the M25 service stations. Um, they also did this on a second day as well in this next article from The Guardian. Um, this is their second day of action. And yes, they've... Um, also, what's that um, police officer doing? Just grab them by the neck and move them. Yes, I, it's so frustrating. They treat them with kid gloves. They do behave like children. Well, but... they're also literal vandals at this mm -hmm. point, and I'm pretty sure if some guy showed up in, say, I don't know, a Britain First jacket and started to smash uh, fuel pumps, they wouldn't be playing with the kid gloves, would they? No, they certainly wouldn't. They'd be getting the batons out, I imagine. And the final one is that they blocked major oil terminals and are hiding in tunnels like children. <laughs> like rats. <laughs> like the rats they are. Yeah. Now, um, this is obviously not helping the energy problems by just interrupting the production of oil. I think that that's kind of dumb. It's going to make people turn against you. And then those same mm -hmm. activists are going to be going, oh, the government needs to do something about the, uh, the cost of living problems. Mm -hmm. But yes, these are the people that are pushing this sort of thing, and they are lunatics. So... My advice is, despite these people, go out, buy yourself a nice steak, and have it rare. Have as much fish and chips as you, as you, want, uh, as you fancy. Yes, and then maybe tuck into some fish and chips. That is how you save the planet, by, by, <laughs> by our standards. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as this article from John Tangney, The Hollowing Out of Academia, with a silver tier track for silver and gold tier members. If you want to follow what else we're putting out, you can follow us on Getter at, at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.